Hey everybody. Hope you're enjoying your lunch today. My name is Bill Cuff. I'm with Demand Base. We are really proud to be a sponsor and I hope you guys are enjoying lunch. We have two people that I think most of you here in the audience know pretty well that are going to be uh, having a little fireside chat with you. Uh, David Cummings and Mike Neumeyer. You guys uh, have a good time. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, th all right, so how many people in this room are or were Pardot users? Raise your hand. It's a lot of people. It's pretty exciting. Uh, how many people subscribe to David's uh, daily blog? Oh, really? Okay. If you don't, you definitely should. Uh, and we, I guess I should ask you later on how you write all this stuff, how you're that disciplined or prolific. Uh, and how many have ever seen David in, in a full-on suit? <laughs> You've never seen yourself. Uh, I really don't need to introduce David Cummings. I referred to him earlier this week um, on the Dana Barrett Show as the, uh, the granddaddy of marketing technology. And then I was like... Yeah, and he's younger than me, so it's not really... Dylan Old. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but uh, David's really been at the vanguard with, uh, with Pardot and many other companies that he's been involved with in advancing our ecosystem here in Atlanta around marketing technology and was gracious enough to, to spend some time with us today. So we're going to just uh, jump right in, and, and I want to start by asking you, when you built uh, Hannon Hill and Pardot, and Hannon Hill don't get ta doesn't get talked about a lot, but still chugging along, very successful. Um, you were, when you built those organizations, I mean, it was very early in the marketing technology uh, frenzy. There was no frenzy. I mean, you were actually evangelizing the use of technology in the marketing department. Um, what made marketing attractive to you as a self-proclaimed geek uh, in technology that you're like, I want to go do things for marketing and not solutions for IT? So the, the quick backstory is I had a content management software company servicing the higher education market. And after running the business for seven years, we were very focused on sales and marketing. And so this was back in 2007. And so in 2007, the marketing tools were really geared towards the consumer marketer. We were using constant contact. We were using B2C type tools. But yet, I had a 25-person web content management B2B type enterprise software company. And so the epiphany for Pardot really was, hey, I want a series of tools built from the ground up for the B2B marketer. Right? So when you do B2C email marketing, you can't personalize it from the sales rep that owns the account inside of Salesforce. But inside of Pardot, you can do that. And so the backstory on the Pardot name that a lot of people don't know is we were looking for a word that meant marketing. And so my co-founder and I, Adam, we were looking for a business name. And so we went on to dictionary.com. And back in very, very late 2006, we would type in marketing. And dictionary.com would actually show a translation of whatever dictionary definition they gave you. They would then show the translation in 29 languages. And there it was, pardot, the Latvian verb to market or to sell. <laughs> and since Latvia is actually smaller than the state of Georgia, we figured that nobody would have ever registered that domain name. And, and what's your market share in, in that country? <laughs> I'm sure we dominate. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Pardot's the Latvian verb to market or to sell, went over to GoDaddy and paid $8 for the domain name. And so that was just over 10 years ago. So Pardot's a little over 10 years old now. And here, I've, all this time, I thought it had something to do with the dot and the dash and very technical. And you A just... lot of people ask, is it golf related, having the word par? Ah, yeah. And then the dot, obviously. And a lot of people like to say pardo. So I must have heard Pardo a thousand times. Well, that's the elevated version. That's the that's highest the, yeah. tier. I'd say, no, 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 no. I was born and raised in the South. We call it Pardot. Or dot. Yeah. <laughs> All right. One of the things that uh, Serious Decisions this morning was talking about is um, what I would just call marketing tool overload, 
MarTech tool overload. I mean, uh, what do you think, I don't know, I should have uh, checked the latest uh, number of marketing tools out there. I'm sure it's north of 4,000, right? Anybody know? Anybody check it recently? It's, it's way north of 4,000. Seven? 7,000. Okay, great. A question for the there audience. Who has more than five marketing tools they use? Tools in your department, anything that your marketing team uses. Wow. More than 10 tools. More than 20. Jeff's never bought a, he's never seen a tool he didn't buy. I talked I talk to two different <laughs> He's an ideal prospect. He is an ideal prospect. <laughs> Let me tell you. I talked to two different marketers in the past six weeks, and one had 27 different marketing tools in her department, and the other one had 28 tools in his department. These are tools that the marketing department uses every day. So are folks just buying, I mean, uh, with that many tools, is that really productive? Are, are these departments of 87 people? Uh, these, hopefully they're not departments of three. Because no, no, these are departments whip, whiplash. of six to 12 people in wow. marketing alone. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot of tools. I mean, uh, do you worry um, uh, about marketing tool overload in the CMO suite? Not at all. The reason I don't worry about it is because tools that you can prove ROI, that you can show value, that you can get in the door and say, hey, you do A, B, and C, and we'll deliver X, Y, Z, as long as the tool can show value, marketers want value. They want better ROI, they want better campaigns, better pipeline acceleration. And so my opinion is that as long as the tool can show value and justify itself, then marketers will add another tool to the toolkit. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the marketing toolkit. And, and this morning, we talked a little bit about the uh, MarTech uh, technology stack. What, what do you think are the essential components in today's um, MarTech technology stack for the marketer? So obviously, you've got to have the CRM element, right? A lot of people think marketing, MarTech, but the CRM is often still the single source of truth when it comes to the pipeline and the opportunities and the deals won. And so showing the efficacy of the campaigns really is going to have to tie into revenue generated. So you've got to have the CRM element. Of course, I'm partial to the marketing automation element and marketing automation being the core system of record for campaign execution, whether it's the email marketing or landing pages or any of the elements inside of marketing automation. But today we're seeing a number of different components of marketing. Now one of the hot topics that we've talked about before is around account-based marketing. So account-based marketing, the idea is identifying the best fit accounts, your ideal customer profile in a proactive manner. Not only the accounts that you're engaged with now, but the accounts that you want to be engaged with. No different than named accounts or just the idea of accounts historically. But nowadays, there's so many more tools that you can do account-based marketing with. And so obviously, I'm very partial to Terminus here in town as being one of the co-founders. And so for Terminus, the idea is, you can now show display ads based on people that have been cookied that aren't on your website. So they've been cookied on some other site, and now using their job title and their persona, you can show display ads to them. Now with Google AdWords, you can actually serve up ads to people based on their email address, right? So you take the email addresses of your prospects that are in your tier one accounts, or you take the email addresses of the accounts that are current open opportunities in your pipeline, and you serve up more content to them through Google Ads, through banner ads. And so this idea of account-based marketing, there's so many more tools now that you can actually reach people in a proactive and scalable manner. And then in a lot of functions, we're actually finding from the outbound perspective, tools like Sales Loft here in town, we're finding that 50% of marketing departments are actually running the SDR, sales development reps, business development reps, from within the marketing department, right? So these are the appointment setters, the demand gen, the demo setters within the organization. We're finding that- How many folks here uh, have their SDRs in their marketing department? Okay. So from a marketing point of view, you know, sales loft historically would have been thought of as a sales tool, but we're finding that more and more marketing departments are running that outbound appointment setting function. And so Sales Loft is really a marketing tool if it's inside the marketing department. Where do you think those SDRs should sit? I actually think they should sit inside of marketing, yeah. right? The sales archetype versus the marketing archetype. The sales archetype is typically a little more pushy, a little more aggressive, a little more in your face. 
And the marketing archetype is typically more analytics oriented, typically more compassionate, typically more people oriented. And so people ask me, hey David, what was the big difference between selling IT software to universities versus selling Pardot to marketers? And my answer was, I would go to marketing trade shows and I would look forward to meeting marketers because of the archetype, because of the personality style. And so thinking about demand gen from the appointment setting, SDR, BDR, outbound element, really at the end of the day, they're measured by the number of qualified sales accepted leads, the number of qualified appointments. And in my opinion, that's very much a marketing function. Okay. What about marketing orchestration as a category? So yeah, some of the buzzwords right now, marketing orchestration is- Sounds the, great, you know? Right, uh, Terminus uh, just last week announced marketing orchestration among other new features in their product. The idea with marketing orchestration is that with the proliferation of all these marketing tools, now there needs to be a system that coordinates between the different applications. So imagine one product where you can go in there and visually lay out, this is what's gonna happen when a new account comes in or a lead comes in that matches to this account. And we're gonna start with a 16 step process, but that 16 step process includes some triggered emails from Pardot, some scheduled cold calls or follow-up calls inside of Sales Loft. It includes some display advertising or banner advertising from the ad tech module in Terminus. It includes a direct mail piece that's automatically triggered by way of printing for less. It includes some social touches through Hootsuite automatically coordinated and orchestrated through it. And so this idea of having a system that transcends the main products from each of the major categories, I think is gonna be one of the big trends in the next three years. Okay, well let's talk about trends. We promised in the program that you were gonna look into your crystal ball. I know you, last night you spent a lot of time looking into your crystal ball. Um, to talk about what technologies are gonna shape the MarTech landscape in the future. So let's knock off a few and hear what you have to say about them. Number one, what is it? Absolutely, one of the trends that I'm really excited about is this idea of a customer data platform, right? So customer data platform is uh, aggregating the data from a lot of different sources, right? So from a marketing perspective, you actually wanna understand the entire life cycle of the customer. Right, so from a customer data platform, you want your Pardot data in it. You want your raw, detailed Pardot data in it, right? So if you think about Pardot or Marketo or HubSpot or Acton or any of the major marketing automation vendors, when they sync into the CRM, they only sync the high-level information, right? So it's the score and it's the grade and it's the recent activities, but there's a wealth of behavior information inside of the marketing automation system. And then think about Hootsuite, think about your social engagement type products, think about your influencer products, think about your outbound engagement products like Sales Loft, doing phone and email and social touches. And then think about the complete customer life cycle, right? Think about your help desk software, think about Zendesk and desk.com. And so this idea of a customer data platform is bringing in all of the detailed raw data from all of these systems that touch the prospect that touched the customer, that touched the entire life cycle of it, and then making sense of that information and then making it actionable. So right now we have a lot of silos. The really high level information is synced between the different silos, but there is a wealth of information that is not actionable right now, and it can be and it will be with a customer data platform. So you're talking about getting outside of the marketing department. No, no, it's in marketing. No, no, the, 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 Customer data platform, and we'll get into who's working on that. You can tell us about that. But as far as the silos of data, I mean, you want to touch the ERP system and pull information out of the ERP system and the supply chain system and the, the help desk data from all and over. Invoicing. Invoicing, yeah. I mean, these customers yeah. pay on time. Maybe they should get something better than the ones that don't and things like that. And when we spoke uh, last time, you even mentioned also getting down to the employee level and things like um, pulling data from calendars and appointments. And Absolutely. So one of the companies in the Atlanta Tech Village is a company called Calendly.com. Does anybody use Calendly for scheduling? And so the idea from a Calendly point of view is that it's a system to do a scheduling overlay on your calendar. So instead of playing the phone tag or email tag 
to find a time to meet with somebody, they get a link, and that link has rules behind it as to when you're available to meet, what type of meeting it is, the length of the meeting, any required questions you want answered before the meeting. And so tons of salespeople, customer success people, support people have Calendly links in their footer or their signature of their email. So you, they send out an email, and in the signature it says, you know, schedule a meeting with me. And it has a link, and it goes into Calendly. And so Calendly now has a wealth of information related to what meetings were scheduled by whom and when and what frequency. And then Calendly synchronizes that data into salesforce.com and other systems. And so you could think about the number of times that a sales rep has had meaningful interaction with a sales accepted lead and that data didn't show up anywhere, right? So they made a Google Calendar event to meet with Sally and they didn't log it in the CRM. They sent an email to Johnny and he replied and they replied and all kinds of good stuff happened over email and the sales rep never acknowledged it inside of the CRM. But with tools nowadays, that can all be automated and so it provides a richer perspective from marketing to be able to not only see that information, but also to act on it. So are there already um, examples of customer data platforms out there today? Companies that are starting to make that happen? Uh, no clear leaders right now. So there's a lot of companies that have it in the works right now. Are you in. thinking of getting in that space, maybe? Um, some, some companies that I'm involved with are considering their options. So it's an area that I'm optimistic about, and I'm sure we'll see some here in Atlanta. That well, and it, and it does make sense with the CMO being charged with the, now with the customer experience. That's right. Uh, he or she needs that full 360 view of how that customer interacts with their organization. Right, and that segues well with the account-based marketing. Some people call it account-based engagement or account-based sales. And so one of the areas that marketers are really struggling with is seeing the full view of the account, right? So we have this account, it's part of our tier one or tier two, so it's one of the ones that's been named as a high priority. And we have all these different systems doing things. Pardot is sending emails. Salesforce.com, people are completing tasks. Sales Loft, people are making calls and sending semi-personalized emails. And then of course all the other systems out there. And so it's really hard to get an account specific view of all the activities that are going on, all the different ways that sales and marketing is engaging with that account. And so I think that's another area of opportunity to help not only automate that, but also to make it more actionable. Okay, so beyond that trend, what, what is another technology you think that's gonna make a, a major dent in MarTech? So we've been hearing about this term machine learning and artificial intelligence for a long time. And I think what we're gonna see, and we're already starting to see it at the smaller startups, is taking information that was previously done through a workflow system. So a workflow system is any sort of product that a sales and marketing person or any line, any sort of functional area, uses on a regular basis, right? So historically, they've been specialized databases. So if you think about salesforce.com, salesforce.com is really a specialized sales database with interfaces into it and then thousands of applications that hook into it. But really at its core, it's a very specialized, very scalable database. And so there's thousands of these specialized databases out there in a variety of different functions. What we're gonna see is taking all of this rich information that's been captured in these systems and making it more actionable. So at the simplest level, machine learning is very much like a regression analysis, except saying, hey, here, here's a data point and how well does it fit the model? With machine learning, you can have thousands of data points and then you can have lots of different models and lots of different ways to figure out what fits and what doesn't fit. The most popular example of machine learning right now is the Tesla autopilot feature, right? So you can get in a Tesla today, drive down the connector, go 70 miles an hour, and then as the connector splits off and goes into 75, hopefully soon 85 as well. But as you go up 75, the Tesla will drive. You see the steering wheel move. You see the car speed up and slow down while you're sitting behind the wheel, not touching anything. And all of that is done through machine learning, taking the video data, the radar data, just taking all the sensory input from the car 
and then feeding it into the onboard supercomputer, which is saying, based on past experiences, based on past driver habits, here is the action they performed. And so as that data is being fed through all the sensors in the car, the car is moving the steering wheel based on seeing the lines on the road go to the left. The car is slowing down based on the car in front slowing down and the radar saying, hey, that car in front is actually not going as fast as it used to. And so that's all machine learning, and we're going to see that applied to marketing. So will that somewhat negate the need for workflows and, and schedules and things like that in marketing automation systems? It, it just make it intensely smarter. It wouldn't negate the need for it, but you can imagine a system where in Pardot you set up your drip campaigns, you set up your automation rules, you go into the Pardot engagement studio, and you set up how the campaigns are going to run. But at first, you've got to start somewhere. So you say, day one, send this email if no activity. Day three, send this next email if no activity. Schedule a task inside of salesforce.com for somebody to call them. So you've got to start somewhere. And then as the system starts running, behaviors are being tracked against the prospects. Deals are being won, closed in the pipeline. And so over time, you have rich information. Right now, that campaign, that drip program is static. You can go in and change it if you want, but by default, it doesn't change. And by default, there are no recommendations for how to make it better. So somebody has to start the workflow. Somebody has to start creating the initial rules, but then using machine learning, using pattern recognition, the software can come back and say, hey, your second step was actually two and a half days after the first step. And based on behaviors and based on all this information we have, we actually think you should wait and make that three and a half days after the first step if there's no activity. Or we've seen that your sales team is responding to your inbound leads that have a grade of an A or B within 90 minutes based on data that's inside of sales loft or in the sales, you know, inside of the CRM. And based on the pattern there, we've seen that if they call within 22 minutes of an inbound lead, the connect rate actually goes up 50%. So we recommend implementing this automation rule to ensure that if a lead comes in and it's not called within 22 minutes, somebody else is notified or a phone call is queued up for somebody else to make. So getting smarter over time, and that's a really tactical example. Sure. Uh, and it will require a pretty sizable database of transactions. Yeah, you need the details. You need the data with which to analyze to come up with those recommendations. Um, so same thing there. Is, is that technology, it's, is it just going to be embedded in current MarTech offerings? Or will there be a new category, a hybrid? What do you think will, will happen there? My prediction is most of the vendors won't be able to keep up. Most of the vendors will stay so focused on their bread and butter that elements of the market will pass them by. My prediction is actually that we'll see new vendors that from day one, the core of their system is built around machine learning, mm -hmm. and then they add these modules onto it. So you think about the main modules in a marketing automation system, email marketing, landing pages, lead grading, lead scoring, automation rules, drip programs, forms, all these different modules. And so my belief is we'll actually see a new crop of startups that have machine learning at the core from day one, and then they introduce those modules, just like the existing incumbents have, only because it's been built around machine learning from the beginning, it's actually gonna be smarter, it's actually gonna be more native to it. And the end result is that the marketers are gonna get greater levels of success from it. Okay. Um, what's the next prediction or trend? We talked about intent data, you wanna talk a little bit about that? Sure, so we're seeing some really interesting things out in the market. Has anybody in here heard of Bombora? A couple hands. So the idea with Bombora is actually tracking people as they use third-party websites that are more news-oriented, content-oriented. So imagine you're on demandgenreport.com or dmnews.com and you're reading an article about marketing automation. And then you get to the end of the article, and there's another article that says, hey, here are more best practices on marketing automation. You click on that article, and then you spend three minutes reading it. And so you're spending time, you're showing intent on a third-party neutral site, 
Well, that third-party neutral site has cookies on it, and those cookies are part of the double-click network or other types of networks, such that you're known generically by some third party. But now as marketers, we want to market to you saying, hey, we know you've spent 18 minutes on other sites looking at content that we believe is relevant. And so now we actually think that you're a more likely prospect, even though you haven't raised your hand to talk to us yet. So there's a number of services out there that are capturing intent data on neutral content sites across all categories, not just marketing technology, and then making that data available to marketers to proactively send the right message at the right time to the right person. So I think capturing intent data is another smaller category, but one that's interesting nonetheless. And that's a way for the third-party sites to start monetizing their traffic, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, does the consumer care anymore about privacy, or is that creepy? I, I mean, maybe the consumer's so conditioned now that they're just assuming that their click paths are, are being sold. That's a good question. During the Pardot days, we would work really hard to coach our new customers to not be creepy. Right, as we've all seen with marketing automation. Two minute call, right? I see you're on the website 30 seconds ago. The sales reps are so eager to call them up and say, hey, you're on the pricing page right now. Let me talk to you about it. So there is an element of not being creepy, figuring out what the right balance is in the cyber stalking of your prospects. I think in this day and age, though, we've seen what can happen when you have such amazing levels of personalization. At lunch, we were talking about Amazon.com and how when they recommend products, they're often super relevant. And so having this level of personalization, this level of you know, on-demand, dynamic content and information and call-outs and just the relevancy is so much higher or has the potential to be so much higher that from a marketer's perspective, we're always going to be asking that question, at what point have we gone too far or at what point our consumer is going to be even more concerned with their privacy. But my belief is that we've already given up our privacy, many of us have, through our tweets, through our Facebook pages, through a lot of things at the consumer level. And so the functions that we're focused on or we're talking on are really your business profile, your business behavior. And so in that regard, typically the business functions have less privacy than the consumer functions, even though there's a human behind both. Okay. Um, another big buzzword out there, um, blockchain. You can't uh, look at your computer or read anything in technology without blockchain. Any application in the MarTech world? Does anyone in here own Bitcoin? Come on, somebody in here must own. I saw a hand over there. there. Be proud, be proud. The first six months, the first six months after owning, or after starting the Tech Village, I saw this Tesla in the parking deck, and the Tesla had a license plate that said Bitcoin. And so I reached out to the entrepreneur, and he said that he had paid for the entire Tesla using Bitcoin. And so it turns out that he had gotten in and had purchased a lot of Bitcoin at less than a dollar a coin. The value had gone up substantially, and he found a dealer that was willing to take payment in Bitcoin. So there is a Bitcoin Tesla at the Atlanta Tech Village. But the idea behind blockchain, blockchain is really the underlying core of Bitcoin, right? So Bitcoin is a, a way to use blockchain for the purposes of you know, a virtual currency. But the idea behind blockchain is really a public ledger of debits and credits. So a way to keep track of things, but to do it in a way that there's no central authority. There's no central bank, there's no central company like a Facebook doing their Facebook currency. And so how does blockchain, how does that fit into the marketing world? How does that fit into MarTech? One simple example would be using blockchain to store all of the relevant signals about a company, about an account, right? So as marketers, we're always interested in information around company size, number of employees, amount of revenue, headquarters, address, headquarters, city, state, zip, country, the number of employees in different job functions, the list goes on and on, their tech stack, you know, the common keywords that they use, 
their NAICS codes, all these different types of firmographics and technographics that marketers love to understand and love to know about their accounts. Imagine having a blockchain for company information such that it's the official public ledger across all of these different dimensions or signals that's not owned by anybody, but as part of the community that has this blockchain access, they help keep track of it. You can think of it as crowdsourcing, but doing it in a scalable, determinable way for company information, for people information, for job title information, for any sort of marketing data that you buy on a regular basis, using blockchain as the back end can make it much more high quality. So that's an area that I think we're gonna see blockchain usage around data for companies and people at those companies. So you heard it first here at the Geek Out that it's not just for FinTech anymore. Blockchain can, can be used in other areas. Um, uh, Talking about those new types of technology and how they might be coming into the uh, CMO's domain in the marketing department, uh, the initial question I asked you was, boy, it sounds like we don't need marketing anymore. Uh, but it definitely sounds like the DNA of the marketing department is, is going to flex and expand in different ways. So what do you think uh, tomorrow's marketer is, what's the profile going to have to look compared to today's? Absolutely. Has anybody seen that Gartner stat that by next year, marketing is going to have a bigger IT budget than IT? Has anybody seen yeah. that stat? Yeah. Yeah. And so people are like, are you for real? How is marketing going to have a bigger IT budget than IT? Well, when you have 27 apps. <laughs> and so the idea there is that the marketing function is becoming so much more technological. The marketing function is becoming so much more analytical. The marketing function is becoming so much more accountable. And so going forward, I think that trend is gonna continue. I think marketing is gonna have expectations of delivering ROI and proving it and having it be quantifiable across the board. And so as we have more marketing apps, more software as a service for MarTech, I think that trend is just gonna continue. More analytical, more budgets, more types of campaigns, more specialized systems. Is there still room for the creative group in marketing? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah? Storytelling is never going to go away, right? Humans were tribal oriented and we always will be. So storytelling and messaging and the creative, that's never going to go away. And we talked about the fact that this, the CMO now, with owning the customer experience, owning the marketing channels, uh, owning not just acquiring, but keeping customers lifetime value, a lot more cross-functional uh, across the entire organization, especially as you talked about the customer data platform, CDP. Um, One of the areas that I'm excited about is smarketing. Smarketing, okay. Smarketing, right? Even in this day and age with Hashtag so, smarketing right with now. so many tools out there, there still is a sales and marketing misalignment in a lot yep. of companies that I talk to. Again, the sales reps have a different archetype. Typically, marketing has a different archetype. Typically, the sales reps are very instant gratification oriented. And then marketing is more strategic, more long-term oriented in general. And so I think there's another area, and this is more of a, a human thing, and there can be some technologies that help facilitate it, but the sales and marketing alignment is still a challenge. And I still see companies that are doing great, but the alignment is definitely not there. Yeah, well, I think I definitely agree with you. I think everyone in the room would. There's that huge disconnect. Um, is the CMO, are we going to start seeing uh, more CMOs rise to be CEOs inside organizations as they've had more experience across all the functions in the organization? I think so, right? And so this idea of marketing transcending not just marketing, but also including customer experience, also having the largest IT budget, also having the largest budget in some cases because of the number of events and the amount of advertising purchased, at the end of the day, marketers in certain organizations are the lifeblood of the company. And so from a marketer's point of view, marketers that are CMOs or head of marketing that demonstrate a great track record, absolutely, I think we're going to see more CMOs become CEOs. Cool. 
All right, Atlanta. Let's talk a little bit about Atlanta. You, you like to talk about Atlanta. That's a great thing. You've been a, a huge supporter of a number of initiatives here in Atlanta. Um, what do you think about our ability to really make a claim that we're one of the global capitals of marketing technology? I think it's absolutely right. One of the things I love telling people about Atlanta is that we have one of the largest marketing technology clusters in the world. So if you add up all the employees in town that work in marketing software companies, and so the obvious ones are MailChimp, 600 employees, Silverpop, you know, north of 600 employees, Pardot, 600 employees, and then you go down the list of Sales Loft and Terminus and Calendly and, you know, just so many more amazing marketing software companies in town that there's over 3,000 people in Atlanta working in MarTech, some form of MarTech. And so 3,000 people, that's a serious cluster. That's a critical mass, especially for an area like marketing technology. And one of the reasons that gets me so excited is that it's a fast-growing market, right? MailChimp's adding 200 employees a year here in Atlanta. And so from a community point of view, the stronger our marketing technology community is, the stronger we are as a greater community. Why did that, uh, why did that cluster start to form here in Atlanta? That's a great question. I've, I've speculated a number of different reasons why that cluster formed, and I have my own theory, and this is my own theory. My own theory is that in Atlanta, we've always had a really strong agency community interactive agency, digital agencies, traditional advertising agencies. And so Atlanta being the capital of the Southeast, we've had a number of excellent advertising agencies over the years that have serviced both Atlanta and the greater region. And so having a number of advertising agencies, and in that advertising agencies, I include web design firms, web development firms. And so if you think of MailChimp, MailChimp's official name today is still the rocket science group and the rocket science group was web design for many, many years. And so having a really strong agency world that then morphed into an interactive agency slash web design world, which is very focused on marketing, which is very focused on customer acquisition, that then led to companies like What Counts, companies like MailChimp, companies like Pardot, although Pardot came from my background being a web designer first, and then building a content management system to make the web design maintainable. And then after the content management system, marketing automation with Pardot. But very much this generation of designers and media companies. And then from an Atlanta point of view, we're very much a can-do town. Very much the spirit of, oh, I'll go do that. I can figure that out. And so now we have 3,000 people working in awesome marketing technology companies but I think the genesis of it was the really strong media and advertising and design that we have here in Atlanta. Yeah, and what I might toss into that also, because every once in a while they get a bad rap, um, are big brands in town. I mean, we're a big brand town. Right, and the know? big brands are one of the reasons why we had so many good right. agencies and, in town. And they care about yeah. that a lot and finding new ways to do things differently. And even though they were, uh, most of them are B2C brands, That's right. Um, Atlanta's always been a big professional service uh, A big professional service city. Town. So. And then, of course, Coca-Cola, one of the yep. most famous brands in yep. the world that has some of the best marketing in the world. It that, is a marketing company. It's That's a marketing what it company, is. right? Yeah. It sells yeah. you know, very expensive sugar water yeah. that people love. And also just plain world. water and lots of great nutritious beverages. Yeah. Let's not get Coke mad at us. <laughs> we love Coke. We have a Coke, we love Coke freestyle machine in the tech village. It's awesome. We have a Coke-themed conference room because we want to pay respects to the great brands in Atlanta. And we're in the Wizard of Oz room here, UPS, mm -hmm. today at, at the Ladder Milk Center. Um, so has anybody heard that theory as to why we have such a good marketing technology community? I asked people the question, and I haven't heard any theory, so that's the only one that Now you have. The theory's been set right here. Right, so... Dissertations can be written about Hopefully it. we're having a conversation 10 years from now, and we have... 10,000 people in Atlanta working on MarTech companies. That'd be great. That'd be awesome. All right, speaking about MarTech companies, um, tell us a little bit about one of your new ventures, Lead Time. 
I'm intrigued by it. It's interesting. You've had sure. a few pivots, yeah. but in very cool directions. So my new venture is called leadtime.com. And what we do is we crawl all the home pages of companies in the United States. We categorize all the keywords found on their home page. And then we figure out how that relates to the existing customers that you have. And then the total addressable market, the customers that you don't, the prospects and accounts you don't have in your CRM. And so the idea is that because of search engine optimization, because of obviously the internet being the front door to most companies, now the homepage actually has a wealth of information on it. And so the idea behind lead time is, let's take all this information that marketers have been marketing to the world with it, let's categorize it, and let's use it for reverse marketing. Let's use it to figure out where the look-alike accounts are that aren't in my CRM today, but should be. Let's figure out what the total addressable market is for these sub-segments of categories. Right, you go into Hoover's or Dun & Bradstreet, and they have their big broad categories, but you'll see a lot of companies fall into like custom computer programming services. But that's any software company. But many of our companies we sell to much more specialized, whether it's cybersecurity or marketing agencies. And so having a system that can tell you, here's the total addressable market, here's what you have today, here's what's not in your CRM today, and then here's a bunch of other ways to make this data actionable that's the idea behind leadtime.com. Very cool. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so we looked forward. I, I just want to look back for one second here. If you had to do something over again, what would, what would your do-over be? Any, anything pop to mind? I think I've had a pretty good run at it. You have had a pretty good run. Everyone agree? Yes. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's been a pretty good run. Some of the tactical items, I think in the Pardot days, we didn't realize just how special it is what we had, right? So when we sold the business, we had a little over 13 million in recurring revenue and sold for almost 100. Two months ago, as part of Salesforce.com, four years after the sale of the business, the Pardot business unit hit the 200 million in annual recurring revenue milestone, right? So go from 13 million to 200 million in four years and growing crazy fast. I think in hindsight, you know, we just didn't know what we didn't know. So no regrets on it, right. but pretty amazing to think that the business opportunity was so much larger than we had even imagined. But if you hadn't done that, then the nice shiny building we know is right. The tech village wouldn't tech have village wouldn't have happened. Sales loft and terminus. Yeah, and, yeah. So that's yeah. so that's awesome. All right, I wanted to save time uh, to have folks from the floor ask questions, and I think Scott's grabbing a microphone. Uh, so, what questions do you have for David? And I walked around the room to make sure there'd be questions. This is your one shot right now. Now he's probably not going to. I gonna, don't see any hands. He's probably oh, not going to troubleshoot Pardot for you, but he might. He might. If there was something very vexing about the system, he might know a workaround. So you talked about the customer data platform, um, and I've been reading a lot about like the CXOS, an operating system. Is that that's sort of the same thing? Like yeah, the APIs, cust customer experience. The idea that marketing doesn't start and stop with just the acquisition of the customer but you have product marketing through the life cycle, obviously the renewal period and the customer success function, and then just how the customer's doing, right, in terms of cross-sells and upsells, but also in terms of the help desk software, in terms of the professional services management software. There's so many other pieces of information that inform the customer experience operating system, the CXOS. And so don't you think a lot of the digitally native companies, some of them have that, and legacy companies are through this customer data platform we're gonna to try, to, try to catch up? I haven't seen too many companies that do it well. From a software perspective, there aren't any breakout success stories yet. There aren't any companies that have demonstrated clear leadership in the market. But I'm optimistic that in the next two to three years, we will see it. But as a marketer, myself as a marketer, I wanna see the whole customer life cycle. I wanna understand the whole customer experience and I want a system to tell me actionable insights. I want recommendations as to how to make it better. Gotcha. Okay. Yes, right up here, PGI. Hey, 
Hey, David. I have a question um, in terms of, if you think from a global marketing perspective, um, we're faced with a lot of, I guess, confusion about privacy laws in so many countries and um, all of, even in Canada, um, their, their spam is, is so much more restrictive. And I'm just curious if you have any insights on technologies or today or that might evolve that will help us circumvent some of the, legally circumvent, shall I say, some of the uh, restrictions that we're facing. Yeah, that's a great question. Obviously, Canada has one of the more restrictive spam laws. EU is very restrictive on their privacy. And so the United States is somewhat like the wild, wild west in that there are laws around it, but the laws essentially say as long as you send them an email and you have your address and you're not spoofing the reply to, it's more or less legal. And so to your question around workarounds, I haven't, I haven't heard of good workarounds right now. But as a technologist, whenever I hear of more restrictive things like the Canada anti-spam laws, I think that there's another opportunity for some more technology to help enforce and make sure that you don't get in trouble. So I don't have any good answers for you, but I think there's a market opportunity to help you sleep better at night that you don't accidentally spam somebody in Canada. Yeah, that, that's bad. Yes. It seems that the marketplace gets noisier and noisier with, in part due to automation. Any thoughts on influencer marketing? It doesn't seem to be growing much, and yet it seems like that would, might get through some of the noise and the clutter. Yeah, I've seen a number of great companies in the influencer marketing space, but I haven't seen any uh, breakout successes yet. Obviously here in town, Insight Pool is making some noise around it, and there's Tap Influence in Colorado, there's a number of them out there. And so the short answer is I don't know, but I agree with you that it seems like there should be more opportunity there, but just haven't seen the, the breakout success yet. But it is very noisy. I think that's gonna be one of the top five challenges for marketers in the next five years. The proliferation of these tools across all different categories is gonna create more and more noise. And so how do you cut through that noise as a marketer? I think that's gonna be one of our top five challenges as a community. And there'll be some room for software to help with that. So as far as all that MarTech and software and noise, um, do you see like a set of standards coming up? Maybe someone will develop a set of standards, like maybe like certain standard fields that are always on certain objects or like a set of standard objects like lead and account and all that and you try to meet those standards? It's not gonna happen. Nope. Not even with the blockchain idea? Nope. I think from a community point of view, especially on the technology side, everybody has their little fiefdom, their little area that they do well in, or big area in some cases. And I think there's gonna be an opportunity, there already is, for marketer, marketing tools that help translate in the middle, sort of like a Rosetta Stone between different products. There's one in Colorado doing well called cloudelements.com, and there's plenty of other ones out there. And so I don't think there's gonna be a standard, but I think there'll be more tools to help alleviate some of the pain, because I know exactly what you're talking about. The desire to customize is just too, mm -hmm. too overwhelming, so, yes. i got a question that's related to a lot of the earlier questions, I guess, but because there's so much more, like the Venn diagram of marketing, sales, customer experience, and IT are changing and getting closer and closer, do you see companies starting to restructure around the, the new emphasis we're having so that besides just the CMO maybe having a fast track to CEO, do you think there's going to be really a, a structural change in how companies approaching how they deal with the entire customer experience from engagement through retention? Yeah, uh, Sales Loft just hired the SVP of global support from Zendesk. And so now he's a new executive over at Sales Loft. And at Sales Loft, his title is Chief Customer Officer. And so the idea is that it's, it's more than just support, but it's support and it's implementation and it's onboarding and it's customer success. And so this idea of the Chief Customer Officer that transcends some of these more siloed functions to so think more around the whole entire customer experience. So I think we're gonna see more chief customer officers or the VP of customer experience. I think that's gonna be a trend as well. 
Yes, right back here. Hi, this uh, sort of goes back to uh, what you were talking about with intent data. Um, with recent uh, news that Google is going to build in an ad blocker in the next version of Chrome, and that the FCC is at the same time going to sort of release uh, whatever regulations there are on ISPs to track their consumers, what does that do for us as marketers? We're sort of caught in the middle. I actually think for marketers it's going to be really beneficial. The FCC, one of the rules they took away was to be able to package up your browsing history for the ISPs to sell it. Now it wasn't clear whether it was identified or anonymized, but your browsing history is another form of intent data. And so from a marketer's perspective, being able to act on that, being able to figure out, hey, you know, 5% of the people that visit my website also visit this other adjacent site, and that adjacent site isn't competitive with me. It's not like they went to a competitor's website. And so being able to use that to inform ways to do joint marketing or co-marketing type programs. Your point about the ad blocker and Google announcing in their Chrome product that they're going to allow blocking ads, I think that's a really big deal. And so I think that's going to affect consumer marketers more than business marketers. But I think that's part of, there's lots of noise out there. And as marketers, it's going to be just getting harder and harder to cut through the noise. Um, David, um, my question has to do with the buyer and sales. So with it being a subtle matter that most buyers have already done their research before they visit your website, mm -hmm. but then yet again, we have all these tools um, that are able to follow the buyer around and to maintain top of mind awareness. Do those, do those two contradict each, each other in any way? I mean, if the buyer's already done the research, do we need to constantly touch them and touch them and touch them? Has a buyer evolved over the last couple of decades to where these endless, tool, these endless tools are actually necessary? So I think it depends on a few different things. There is a ton more self-service on the research side and on the getting informed about what it is you're interested in. There's a huge element, as you probably know, from a sales point of view where a lot of sales functions, at least selling into mid to large companies, the sales function is to really act as the change management organizer, right? So the salesperson that's bringing together the different stakeholders, bringing together the decision makers, bringing together the plan for how this would look when it's rolled out, the plan for the pilot. So it depends on the function. So some salespeople are very much order takers, some salespeople are in between, sort of lightly consultative. And then some salespeople are very much needed to enact change within a mid to large organization. I do think one of the trends that we're going to see more of, to your point earlier, is around websites becoming less locked down. There's one analogy out there that I, I like, which is most people treat their website, myself included, like it's somebody walking into the store, like a retail store, but you can't talk to the person behind the counter until you give them your name and email address, right? And so if any of us walked into a retail store, if we walk into Nordstrom's and we had to give our name and email before they would help us, we'd walk right out. Yet that's how the vast majority of B2B marketing websites are. And so what does the future look like? The future looks like having a live chat agent on the website, like many sites do, that live chat agent being driven by a, an automated chat bot, a computer that's acting like a, a person chatting with the prospect that's on your website, using machine learning, answering their questions, using natural language processing. And then once some, when some threshold is met, that chat bot hands it off to a real person or that chatbot helps that person schedule a time on their own schedule, like using Calendly, to actually meet with somebody. So this idea of the website no longer being a retail store where you have to give your name and email address before you can get service, to one where you always have live service available, you have more information available that's not behind some download form. So you can download your eBooks, you can see your webinars, you can watch your videos, 
and you can do it without giving your email address, and all the while you have a chat bot to provide the first level of customer service, but yet it's all automated and you don't even know it. I think that's another trend. So it's like a concierge service helping guide the prospect through the website to get where they want to go quicker. And you don't have to man it with a live mm -hmm. human. Nice. We don't need humans anymore. Um, <laughs> no, we do. We do. Um, Any more questions? We have a few more minutes. Any more questions? Right there. Oh, right in front sorry. of you. Hey, David. Um, so besides a comprehensive marketing automation tool, what are the top two other tools that are must-haves in your marketing department. So you're limiting your tool by to three <laughs> tools. Three tools. Marketing tools. automation. Not 27. Three. Not 27. Three. Yeah. Okay, so interesting. Well, if I put my Atlanta Chamber of Commerce hat on. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. Thank you, yes. You gotta have sales hat. loft <laughs> to do your personalized engagement. You gotta have terminus to do your account-based marketing. Um, but Sounds like you're loading the stable there. With, what, uh, what, what about our sponsor, Demand Base? <laughs> and Demand Base, if Terminus isn't a good fit for you, go to Demand there Base. There you go. Um, I really think it depends, right? So if you're doing more SMB type marketing, there's tools that are more applicable to there. If you're doing more enterprise type engagement, there's tools there. So I, I think it really depends on your lifetime value of the customer, your average sales cycle, your average dollar amount for a deal, the annual contract value, I think it just, I think it just depends. Great. One last question right here. Hi, um, I own a marketing and marketing recruiting and staffing firm. Mm -hmm. And currently marketing automation is kind of the in high demand position that um, my clients and, and lots of companies are looking for. Do you have any thoughts on what the next trend will be for that position that's in high demand? Absolutely. We've, we've all heard the term data scientist. Data scientist is just a, a fancy word for saying analyst. And so the marketing analyst, the marketing data scientist, the marketing function that loves spreadsheets, right? So the CMO over at Terminus is a gentleman named Sangram, and Sangram used to be the head of marketing over at Pardot. And Sangram has an undergraduate degree and a master's degree in computer science. So he has a very technical background, but he loves marketing. And so I think that's gonna be another trend, having the technical marketer or the analytical marketer. And I think there's gonna be a lot of jobs to fill in the future that your firm is gonna get a lot of business from. And, and hopefully it'll all be here in Atlanta and, and we'll grow to that, that 10,000 threshold sooner rather than later. Um, at Arketi, we've had a long relationship with you and are, are glad. Much appreciated. Thank you that you could come here today and spend some time with us to talk a little bit about the future of marketing technology. David's going to hang around for a few minutes, but he has to bolt to a board meeting. Um, and then we're going to proceed on to the rest of the day. So, Scott, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you for having me.